Okay, I think I've just gone live. Uh, let me check to make sure. Yeah, I'm seeing myself live. Um, and that's good. Uh, let me know in chat if, if, if everything's correct. You can hear me. I hope you can hear me last week. I actually had a problem because there were some technicalities that... Uh, and because of that, uh, my microphone wasn't working. So that was not a great start. But uh, this time, uh, I hope it's working. Um, but let's go to the chess part of today. Um, today, I'm going to be having a talk about um, same colored bishop endings. So I think yesterday there was a stream about um oh wait yesterday there was a stream about best, no ah uh, tomorrow sorry tomorrow there's a stream as well about bishops but tomorrow's stream is about opposite color bishop endings and um yeah both both kind of endgames are interesting but they are extremely different um same because uh the drawing chances with the uh, from for the side that is worse or much less in the uh same color bishop endings in the same color bishop endings if you're pawn down you're very often simply lost while in the opposite colored en endings um one pawn down is in general simply a draw and maybe two pawns down is uh still a draw sometimes even three pawns so um in opposite color bishop endings, you have a much bigger drawing margin, uh, but those can also be very, very difficult. Also sometimes to win, sometimes to draw. But today it's going to be about um, same color bishop endings. So uh, different from opposite. And I wanted to start with an example. One is one that is somewhat simple. Um, the current position is uh, not too interesting so far. Um, what is up a pawn? But this position was a game between a friend of mine, Aaron Lamy, uh, with White against Yu Yang Yi at the at a recent uh, chess Olympiad. Um, and in the game, Aaron was White and he was trying to defend an end game. It was already a bit worse throughout the game. And at this point, he seemed to be getting closer and closer to that draw that he wanted um, because there is very little material left. But the position remains somewhat tricky because there's this pawn on g3 that can become very, very strong. If at some point white loses the g2 pawn, this pawn is almost there. And on the other end, black is also about to take the b3 pawn. Um, and then this b pawn will also come down the board. So on both flanks, it's already very difficult. Um, so far, white's still pawn down. Uh, sorry, still pawn up. So black first needs to take the pawn. So rook takes b3 happened. Um, and um, white kind of had to exchange uh, bishop takes and now we have this same colored endgame uh, same colored bishop ending without the rooks and um, this is well within drawing margin but the thing is that um, it gets tricky as I already said this g3 pawn is dangerous and the b7 pawn is dangerous and in general um, what you want to have if you're pushing, so in the same color bishop ending, if you're pushing, you want to have your pawns on the squares that are opposite from your own bishop, and you want your opponent's pawns to be on the squares, the same the same color squares as your own bishop. So it's already very, very good for black in this position that the pawns are on white squares, while his own pawn is on uh, a black square, because that means that white is unable to attack the g3 pawn, there's no way this bishop is ever going to attack the pawn. And meanwhile, this bishop on d5, for example, is attack is putting pressure on both pawns. So um, it's definitely great for black that uh, the pawns are in the squares they are right now. So um, in this game, white brought the king to the center. Um, black pushed. Black would like to already get his pawn to the b4 square from which it will be first of all difficult to attack but also it will be very far and very difficult to deal with and one big problem i would like to point out is that whenever white plays f4 to try and get in king f3 black simply plays bishop to d5 so for example here f4 bishop to d5 and uh, the king is never ever getting to f3 
So the G3 pawn will not be lost. Uh, you can still protect G2 with, for example, bishop h3, but now the bishop is very passive and the b pawn comes down the board. Um, the king will have to try and stop this b pawn, but um, with so many weaknesses in such a passive position, eventually black should be able to break through here. I think, for example, uh, bishop to f7 simply first, kind of a waiting move. Um, let's say king to c2 and eventually what you will get is that this king will probably run in um, this king has to keep on stopping the b pawn and then f4 is gonna get weak you have to push f5 but then you pick up this pawn so let's let's give a sample variation king to c5 uh, king to b2 king to d4 uh, king e4 is coming so at some point you have to push f5 but now uh, king to e5 and you simply reroute the bishop in some way maybe maybe it's best to actually go d5 um, and you eventually pick up the pawn and then uh, g2 will be lost so you cannot really push f4 which makes this a very very difficult position for white uh, king to e3 happened trying to go king f4 if king f4 would happen it would already be a draw um, if, he, if he were oh no well the um, if he is able to pick up the pawn and then give this bishop for this pawn, then it will be a draw. The thing, however, is that uh, sometimes you are simply unable to give up the bishop for a pass pawn. So here, uh, black simply pushes b4, and the question is, what happens if king f4? So king f4, um, black will play the move bishop to d1. King takes g3 makes sense. That was our plan all along. But now b3 happens. Um, and the idea is simply not to push b2 first, but to first go bishop to c2. Block this diagonal, um, because white is not able to take on c2, because then the pass pawn on c2 will uh, promote. So after, for example, white plays uh, king to f4, black will play bishop to c2. Uh, driving away the bishop, because this pawn in game is simply losing. So... Um, yeah, white, white is basically lost here because there is no way to stop the pawn. You could, for example, instead of king f4, still try bishop to h7, bishop to c2, bishop to g8. Now you attack the pawn, it has to push, and now you go to a2. And you've stopped the pass pawn for now, because if b1, of course, you're going to take, and it's simply uh, a draw and endgame. But you don't have to push yet. You simply play pink, king to c5, you walk to a3, and there's no way to stop the b pawn because the bishop is going to be lost. So he's, he cannot go after the g3 pawn. And that means that white is kind of still mated. It's still still a draw because white is so active with king to d4. But it's already very, very difficult as you can see. You cannot pick up the g3 pawn. You cannot attack b4. So you're kind of in a position without a plan here for, with white. And um, it got very, very difficult uh, for white to hold this. Um, black played bishop to d1. Um, making or clearing the way for the b pawn and eventually so b3 followed by bishop c2 could be a plan right now um, as we've seen but also one very big idea for what uh, for black sorry is to threaten bishop takes f3 so uh, let's say white plays a waiting move then bishop takes f3 is winning the game because after g takes f3 g2 the pass pawn is you simply cannot stop it so uh, this is already one threat and one idea that white has to be very careful of. In the beginning we saw this bishop um, that this bishop on d5 could put pressure on f3 and g2. And one main reason for that is if you put the bishop to d5 for example and you go king to d3, then as well white has or sorry black has this very very big uh, threat of at some point playing bishop takes f3 and white is unable to recapture because of g2 so that's a very big idea that white has to keep up with as well so uh, loads of ideas for black in this position and um, simply a very difficult position so white defended f3 bishop to d3 bishop to d5 again renewing this threat of bishop takes f3 bishop b4 was played um, he could play this because the pawn in game after bishop takes king takes e4 still draw uh, with the pass pawn f3 what is able to stop this pawn so it's still a draw uh, so bishop to e6 happened f4 and yeah here at some point white kind of needed to make a decision you can keep the pawn f3 where it 
keeps on being defended by the g2 pawn so it can never be taken by this king however the thing is that at some point black is going to be pushing b3 and then try to walk in and uh, try to take g2 so very very big decision again for uh, black is bishop d1 bishop b2 bishop f1 to attack the pawns an idea for black definitely also an idea uh the thing however is that um after bishop to e4 bishop to e2 uh you do stop king c4 so i kind of like this idea as well there's no way to attack the b pawn this way but the problem is as in the game is that at some point you're gonna push f4 with white and um you can attack the g2 pawn but it's simply defended with the bishop so f4 is always a way to defend the pawn the very very big downside of playing f4 other is that uh, the f pawn will simply become weak at some point it's not defended by the g2 pawn anymore so it can very easily become weak so um by maneuvering his bishop around black managed to create a weakness kind of forced why to play f4 at some point and now um things are getting extremely difficult f4 is weak the b pawn is very strong g2 is still weak um so black kept on maneuvering bishop f7 bishop f3 back bishop a2 black's not doing much uh so right now but he's slightly slightly improving his position so he got his king to f6 which means that whenever this bishop leaves this diagonal so let's say it goes to some some like e4 f3 sorry um then king f5 king f4 will happen so the bishop has to keep on covering this f5 square Meanwhile, maybe, for example, uh, king g7, king h6, king h5, king g4 could also be an idea to attack f4. So that's why black would rather not play, or white would rather not play f4, but it did happen. So it's it's a very difficult position. Bishop to e6 happened. You might have seen that at some point white could, for example, um, attack the b4 pawn in this way by playing king to c5. But the problem is always that b3 is going to happen. So king c5 is also not a great idea. So white really has to keep on waiting, which makes its uh, disposition extra difficult. In chess, we usually want to improve our position and uh, keep, yeah, keep on improving. But uh, sometimes you simply have to wait. And for a human being, it's it's very very difficult in general. Um, so Erwin kept on waiting with white, um, and at this point, um, Yu Yang Yi asked him a, a very big question bishop to g6 and the big question is actually not whether to trade on g6 the, the big question is more where to go with the bishop because the pawn in game after bishop takes g6 is very simply lost uh king takes g6 king to c4 king f5 king takes king f4 followed by king e3 king f2 king g2 so the pawn in game is very simply lost but the question is where should white go with the bishop um, if you if you're watching this stream, maybe try to think a little bit about it, um, and try to come up with an answer. Let me know in chat if you if you find the right answer here, um, because White messed up in the game, so it's not uh, it's not so easy. A very strong White Grandmaster, uh, very strong Grandmasters lost this with White, so try to find the right square here. So someone's already suggesting Bishop to B3. That's probably one of the best squares, yeah. Um, in the game, white played the losing move, bishop to d1. Uh, the other two squares are fine. So either bishop to b3 or bishop to a4 is is fine for, for black still. The reason for that is that after uh, bishop to d1, there is one move that wins the game for black. And it's kind of a shocking one, actually. But the winning move in this position is bishop to e8 all of a sudden. And the reason for this move being winning is that after... Um, is that, as I said, first of all, with the king on f6, this bishop has to control this diagonal. Otherwise, king f5 is coming. In this position, though, if you play king to f5, it simply doesn't work out because of bishop c2 check. So you cannot advance yet. So he first gets uh, the bishop out of this diagonal. So that now he's threatening to go king f5 and take the f4 pawn. And the other idea is bishop to c6. And why do we need the bishop on d1 instead of b3 on, or a4? Well, first of all, a4 is the most uh, the simplest square. 
because an a4 uh, simply this move bishop e8 doesn't even exist you, you cannot even get the bishop on this diagonal because it can simply get taken so i think a4 is the sim most simple square and after bishop b3 bishop b8 um this bishop to c6 can be stopped with the move bishop to d5 and now you, you can never go after the f4 pawn or you can actually but uh, white can simply protect it with king e3 uh, followed by bishop e4 check kicking away the king the bishop is rather unfortunate on d1 however because um now if bishop to f3 stopping to uh stopping king no sorry stopping bishop c6 uh black can simply push b3 and this wouldn't have happened with the bishop on d5. So in this position, white needed to go bishop to b3. So that after bishop b8, he can go bishop to d5. And then he would be covering this b3 square. So some very, very little nuances. But it does cost white the game here. Or actually, it should have cost white the game. Because we haven't looked yet at how it ended. Uh, it ended in a funny way. And uh, actually in an instructive way as well. Uh, so bishop to eight happened here. Uh, bishop f3, b3, um, if king c3, then the king can never ever defend the f4 pawn anymore. So uh, king f5, and if king takes b3, we simply march in with the king. King takes f4, king to c3, king to e3, and uh, white is not in time. Black is going to play king to f2. Eventually get his bishop on this diagonal, it can be to a6 or c4, and then go bishop f1 followed by picking up the pawn. So um, this pl plan of king to f5, king takes f4, king to e3, king to f2 has to be stopped with white in some way. And as you can see in the game, uh, white didn't manage to do that. Um, he had to play bishop e4 here to stop that plan. But now the pawn is on b2 instead of on b4. So black made a lot of progress in this game. Sorry, can you go back a bit? What After bishop d5, what about bishop a4, I think you mean? Um, so we had this position and bishop a4 is a good question um, what happens though is that it's kind of difficult to make progress here uh, white can simply play bishop to e4 for example and uh, neither king to f5 or bishop to c6 is allowed so it's kind of difficult to make progress um, so basically what white should have been trying to achieve was get this bishop on this diagonal um while also trying to stop this king f5 plan so white kind of does this by playing bishop b3 to d5 because bishop uh bishop e4 is coming uh stopping king f5 and if black goes king f5 immediately then king e3 happens uh followed by bishop e4 check kicking back the king so black wouldn't be in time here to go king f5 king takes f4 but it's uh it's already quite tricky of course Bishop to e8 happened, bishop to f3, b3, bishop e4, uh, b2, king c3. This we have all seen. And the idea by black was not to try and promote the b-pawn. It was actually trying to sacrifice the b-pawn. So that it was able to get the g2 pawn. Um, in this position, after b2, there are simply not a lot of moves. Um, because either way, whatever move you play here, bishop to c6 is coming. So king to c3 was played, bishop to c6. And um, you, you cannot take the bishop, of course, because then uh, b1 queen happens. So you have to play some other move. You have to move the bishop away. Bishop to d3. Bishop takes g2. King takes b2. And now you've already lost the g2 pawn. So the g pawn is going to try and promote. Usually it's not enough to have only one pawn. But the problem here is that this king is not anywhere uh, near this g pawn. So the king will start uh, marching in. And then uh, simply lost because the g-pawn is going to promote. And we'll see that, that phase next. Um, so bishop to f1. Uh, stopping g2. If g2, of course, you can take and it simply draw. So, um, yeah. And white had to play bishop f1 here, which is a very important point. White cannot keep on protecting the f5 square while also stopping g2. It would only be able to do that on the h3 square, but the bishop is simply not there. Bishop is on, uh, or the bishop was on this diagonal. There was no way to get it to h3 in time, so um, there was no way to do that for white. So bishop f1 was forced. King to f5, uh, trying to take the f4 pawn. King c3, king f4. Uh, 
came to D2. And White was just not in time to stop the king from entering. Uh, king F3 happened. Uh, Black is threatening to play King F2. King E1. And now we get this very interesting situation. Um, and this is actually kind of a good good thing to see, I think, for the same color bishop endings. Okay. Um, if you if you play um, the g2 or whenever you play g2, uh, you can simply take it. So how is how is black ever going to win this position? The idea is of course to get this bishop out of, away from this diagonal. It has basically two squares that can always go to f1 and h3. If you go bishop to uh, d7, for example, then uh, black can play. Uh, white can play bishop to a6. Now g2 doesn't. Well, actually, I think bishop to d7 would have been a very smart move, but we'll get to that later. Um, bishop a6 is kind of forced, so that now after g2 you have bishop to b7 check and you win the pawn. And the idea is basically to force the bishop away from this diagonal, and then whenever it does, you can play king to g2. So right now king to g2, followed by king to h2, and then we get rid of this. And But we'll get to this position a bit later. I want to first show what happened in the game. So bishop e4 happened, and now bishop to h3. And um, this was what happened in the game. And Yu Yangi, of course, understood that he had to get rid of this bishop on this diagonal. And um, he played the very, very shocking move next. Um, he, he actually should have played um, bishop to d3. With the move bishop to h3, uh, White was threatening to play king of 1. Oh, sorry. King of 1, followed by king g1. And then uh, would be draw. If the pawn, if the king gets in front, there's never any way to get rid of the king on g1. And you cannot give any check. You can push to g2, but how do you ever get rid of the king on g1? And the answer is simply uh, you don't. So um, black should have played bishop to d3. But in the game, uh, black went bishop to f5. And now another question: If you're if you're watching, um, how do you think black or white should should play here? Welcome, real best. Welcome to from Anish stream. In the previous position, can White play f5 because then the king has to stay back to stop the pawn? Well, I think White can never really play f5. the The problem for White was that the bishop, the light square bishop, had to prevent g2. Um, so the bishop had to go to f1 at some point to stop g2. And when it, once it goes to f1, you can simply play king f5, king takes f4. So if you play f5 at any point, black will play g2, and white will simply lose the game. So people are saying bishop to f1. Yeah, bishop to f1 is definitely a move. Um, the problem is that this type of position is kind of is losing. We'll get to the technique that black uh, should show to win this game. The very surprising. Uh, why did the very white instead took the bishop, which seems very surprising. The whole idea of black was to give away the bishop so they could play g two. But what happens in this position? How how does white what what move did white play in this position? Yeah, an eccentric horse seems to have seen the move bishop to e four check. Uh, drawing the game. It was very, very nice to see this happening. Uh, Aaron <laughs> Aaron was dead lost in this game, but he, he managed to save the draw uh, with the move bishop to e4. King takes e4 uh, because otherwise you take the pawn. Uh, so bishop to e4, king takes e4, and now king to f2. And suddenly you lose the g2 pawn and the game is simply, simply a draw. So uh, this is not the way to go. Uh, 2770 did this with black, so a very, very, very strong grandmaster uh, drew this position, which is very surprising because it should be kind of elemental for such a strong player. Um, so let's go to the technique actually to win this to win this endgame. Um, so instead, bishop to d3 should have been played. Black should prevent this game from entering to f1. 
Now, uh, white is basically forced to move out the bishop to, let's say, d7. Because sim there's simply no other move here. Um, bishop to f1 is the only other move I can actually think of, which actually makes a lot of sense. Uh, but now bishop to f5 would happen. And kind of the same position would arise. Um, black, white again has to move out the bishop because now there's actually no other square. Um, bishop to g2 is not possible. Bishop to h3 is also not possible. So white has to actually move out the bishop. And now the winning plan for black is to move in the king. King to g2. Um, white will, for example, give a check. King to h2. And for now, we stop this g3 pawn. So we need to find another winning plan with black, uh, which is to kick off this bishop from this diagonal. So the next move should be bishop to h3. Oh, sorry, I uh, black, white has to play waiting move. We play bishop to h3. White has to play another waiting move because he needs to prevent g2. And now we go bishop to g2. He cannot simply take because the pawn in game will be easily lost. Uh, we, we play king to h2 and then go g2. So uh, you cannot take it. So you go, for example, bishop to a6. And now we can go bishop to f3. We have finally kicked off the bishop of the long diagonal. So it needs to return to f1 to uh, stop the pawn in this way. But now at some point, white will simply run out of moves. Uh, we'll retreat the bishop. The bishop needs to stay on f1, which forces a king move. King to a2 makes sense at first, but then we see that check trades off the bishops followed by g2. So another move needs to be played. King to d2 makes sense then. But now, um, actually, I think bishop to b5 should be easiest. Um, yeah, it's quite funny, actually, in this position, whatever white does, what literally, basically, whatever white, uh, which move white makes, you can play bishop to b5 on the next move, luring your way the bishop and then playing g2. So there is actually not a too difficult way to convert this endgame. You simply have to put the king to uh, g2, king to h2, and then you get rid of the bishop on the long diagonal, and eventually you win the endgame. So I have to learn this technique. Does that make me better than a super GM? Um, not sure if it does. It would be would be great. But um, bishop one king of three position. Can't white give bishop e two check? Um, good question. I think however in the so I think we had this position. Sorry, uh, bishop to f one king bishop to f five. If you give this check, uh, king to g two will happen anyway. So it doesn't really stop our plan of playing king to g two. Um, so that will be winning as well. Um, so yeah, this this was actually a very funny game uh, because a very, very strong grandmaster actually made a draw here. Bishop to f5 takes uh, g2, bishop e4 check. While the winning technique was actually rather simple with uh, moving the king, first kicking of the bishop of this diagonal. After you've done that, you move in the king and then uh, you promote the pawn very simply. Um, but I had to include this uh, this game into the stream because it, it was a uh, I think it was a nice hold by Erwin there. He uh, did an excellent thing there, uh, setting up this trick for his opponent. So let's go to another game. And actually, uh, the game I wanted to go to was oh, let me find the right position actually of the game that I wanted to show. I think it was this position. So this was also a game by Aaron Lamy, but this time Aaron ha was pushing. This time Aaron was white. Um, and I very much like this game because it seems like the position is very symmetrical and um, everything is closed down. But uh, white has a bit more space. White has more active pieces. Black has defended everything basically, but white, white has more space. Um, so black tried, had to defend a7 in some way, so he went queen to e7. Now a7 is defended, but Aaron saw an interesting uh, way of playing here. He simply traded the queens. And by trading the queens, uh, he saw some very nice... Uh, he saw some very nice plans here for white. He thought this wasn't a very simple draw. It might seem like a very simple draw at first. There's no way to enter with the king. 
um, the king has nowhere to go. Um, it's not so easy to, like, maybe one plan you could see is uh, trying to uh, walk to the queen side, trying to enter like this. But the moment I think you arrive on a4, black simply plays a6 and there's again no way to enter. Because then the b5 and a4, a5 squares have been covered. So um, you cannot really walk to the queen side. Um, so wh what other plan does white have in this position? Uh, Aaron showed in the melee, he pushed for f5. And uh, one reason, first of all, I would like to state why Aaron saw winning chances in this position was because of a, to a couple of things, but it comes down to one concept, basically. Uh, Aaron has the dark square bishop, while his opponent, Fedorchuk, has also dark square bishop. And in general, um, if you're pushing for a win, I've said this before today, you should be trying to push your own pawns on the white squares, the squares opposite of your own bishop. And uh, you should be trying to get your opponent's pawns to the color of the bishop. So in this case, we have dark square bishops, which means that it's very bad to have all of these pawns on dark squares for black. It's a very bad sign because it will, we will see that all of those dark square pawns will eventually become weaknesses. On the other hand, white has a lot of pawns on light squares at this point, which is a very good thing for white. So um, by just knowing this kind of concept, we can deduct that uh, white is doing very well in this position. Um, hey Mason, it's good. To, I, I think I saw that actually it's, I'm looking forward to it as well on Saturday. See you, see you on Saturday. Um, I guess white is better because the blacks, yeah, exactly eccentric. Um, there are so many pawns on the dark squares that it's simply very difficult for um, black in this position. So um, black was simply waiting. There's really no active move for black to make. He played bishop to h4. Um, Aaron improved his king's position. King to f3, king to h7, bishop to d2 first, bishop to e7, king to e4. Um, there are not a lot of moves in this position for black, but I think black might have made a bit of a mistake here. Um, I think there's not really a way to stop white's plan actually. Uh, black played king to g8. And what moves uh, do you guys think uh, white played here? After king to g8. So does black want to play a6 and then b5 to get the pawns on the light squares? Um, very interesting question actually. Um, the move a6 followed by b5, it does get more pawns on the dark squares and in general you should like to get that. But the problem is that this c5 pawn might become weak. Um, so right now it's still defended by the pawns. But if you push the pawn, c5 might become weak. And another thing is that you don't really want to open up the queen side. Because um, then the king might enter. You probably need the king on g8 to defend the queen's, uh, the king side. The g7 and h6 pawn might become vulnerable. So you need the king on the king side. Um, so if you start opening up things on the queen side, it's probably a bad idea. Also, one thing why I would not be playing a6, b5 is that once you play uh, b5, why... Oh, sorry, I probably shouldn't put the king on d3. Let's say we put the king on f3 and black pushes for b5. One idea that white might have is uh, c takes b5, a takes b5, a4, creating a uh, pass pawn. Uh, c takes uh, b takes a4, b takes a4, uh, followed by king e2, king d3, king c4, picking up the c5 pawn and then uh, storming with the a pawn. So opening up things on the queen side is probably a bad idea. So no, why did not play in this position? Why did not play bishop c3? He went for a more direct uh, approach. He pushed for f6 immediately. And it seems a bit strange to put your pawns on the dark squares uh, I think bishop c3 followed by f6 was also very possible. Uh, probably doesn't change anything to the position. One thing it might change actually is that now the bishop might be able to kind of escape. If you now push your f6, uh, the bishop is outside of the pawn chain, which could be beneficial for black perhaps. So I think it's nice actually to start with the move f6. Uh, so that after bishop d8, bishop c3, the bishop is on a very, very passive square on d8. Um, and why did black not take an f6? Uh, it's very easy. White now takes on h6. 
and uh, creates a pass pawn on the h file which will eventually become very difficult to deal with white will for example play bishop to f4 followed by ef6 bishop takes and then bishop to b8 and you can see why it's so bad to have the pawns on the dark squares because uh, they simply get very weak they're very difficult to defend and um, the h pawn together with this uh, weak queen side will make sure that white is winning here so black cannot give up this h6 pawn so he has to go bishop to d8 um okay see you another time Maslone. um should black have kept the king on h7 so that the h6 pawn is guarded yeah he probably should have done that i think that's why that's why actually i said that king to g8 was a slight mistake um the problem however is that um if you play a move like bishop to h4 um, it's maybe white could actually push for b4 because you don't really want to allow uh, b takes c5 well on the other hand um, because then this e3 pawn gets weak and also the uh, white king might be able to enter on the queen side again so it's actually quite kind of nice to have the bishop on e7 so that it actually becomes somewhat difficult to push for b4 um, so king to g so what black was actually kind of still made it or zugzwang i think zugzwang is the better word there um so bishop f6 happened bishop d8 uh, d8 bishop to c3 defending f6 king h7 and now white played a, ah and now white went for the plan yeah so at the start of this end game um i discussed a bit of uh, a couple of plans and one of the plans was actually to get with the king on the queen side. It was actually kind of uh, difficult to break through because black could play a6. But another idea that I've uh, just said was that we can push for b4. So in a position that we had um, here, white was actually going to combine uh, ideas. Not only is he going to try and enter with the king on the queen side, he's also going to push for b4. Um, so bishop to c7 happened, the waiting move, king to c2, king to g8, black really cannot do anything, king to b2, king to f8, and I think with the, especially with the king on f8, sorry, <clears throat> it's, um, it's very difficult, or it's very easy actually for white to push for b4, because after b4, um, black cannot win a pawn with c takes b4, bishop takes b4, bishop takes e5, because bishop b4 is with a check. However, I think it doesn't really matter because uh, b4 was kind of unstoppable anyway. If king h7, for example, then king to a3. And uh, you simply cannot stop this b4 plan. So b4 was unstoppable anyway. So takes happened. But it's already a bad sign for black that he has to take on f6. Um, the taking on f6 makes this a tick spawn very very weak so it's really not a move you want to make so what happens if instead black just took on took on b4 c takes b4 uh bishop takes b4 would happen now king to g8 is forced protecting g7 but now the bishop is able to enter on d6 um black cannot take because then the e pawn will be promoting uh the d pawn sorry d7 you can also not stop with king to f8 because now you uh, play d7 anyway. King is not even able to go to e7. So um, bishop to d6 would happen, forcing bishop to d8. And now uh, you would first take on g7, king takes, and then um, you could, for example, play king to c3. And eventually... Uh, H not only h6 will become weak but also king to d4 c5 will happen and the king will enter on the queen side making or targeting a6 uh, the a pawn so it's simply a very very difficult uh position so he did not take immediately he took first on f6 he takes f6 and then took on b4 the advantage of taking on f6 instead of allowing white to take on g7 is that you have your own pass pawn on e6 so not all pawn endgames games will be winning for white due to this 
uh, protected pass pawn on e6. So that's the reason why black took an f6. So he, at least he has some trumps in his position. Um, so c takes before, bishop takes before, check happened, king to e8. And now actually Erwin missed uh, a win here in this position. What what move uh, should white have played in this position? If you're watching the stream, try to find the best move for white here. Um, and uh, yeah, try try to play the best move. So the best move has to deal with this uh, king side. So white is very close to making a protect uh, pass pawn. This eight six pawn is weak. So the move uh, bishop c three does make a lot of sense to stop bishop e five. But after bishop f four, black has this diagonal under control. And um, okay, maybe maybe you can still win with king to c two followed by bishop to d two. But it's not the most concrete way to win this uh, position. I think it's still a good move though. I think the most direct way to win this is by playing g five. And it's simply uh, very easily lost. Um, if if g6 would be allowed, it would be a very easy win for white. So black is kind of forced actually to take. But now h6 simply wins the game. Um, because after bishop e5, bishop c3, there's no way to stop the h-pawn. Uh, takes, takes, uh, king to f8, and now h7 wins the game. So I think this was a missed uh, win by white. But... Uh, slower moves are also winning in this position. The position is winning anyway, so it's not necessary to try and immediately uh, win, but it would have been uh, nice to finish it already off. Uh, king to c2 happened. Bishop to f4. King to d3. Um, bishop to g5. Bishop to d2. And now the pawn endgame is probably lost, because after takes takes, um, we do have this protected pawn, a uh, protected pass pawn. Well, white doesn't have a pre uh, any pass pawn at all, but the problem is that this pawn is quite far behind. So, um, what will happen now is that after black waits, for example, um, the king will slowly but surely enter, and at some point, uh, what white is going to be doing is play a4 a5 try to take take and then go after this b6 pawn while stopping the e6 pawn so for example in this very uh, in this position a4 king to e8 and um, we can already play the move a5 here actually one idea i kind of missed was that g5 when, once the king is on e8 we can play g5 because after h g5 h6 the game is winning so you cannot even take, if you have to play king of 8, then, then g6 will be a uh, very, very easy win for white. So I kind of missed that. Um, but let's say the king goes g8 instead to stop this g5 plan. Now king to e5 will happen. King to f8. Uh, a5, you cannot really take because the c5 is going to promote first. Or uh, this uh, queenside pawn. So you cannot take, so king to g8. A takes b6, a takes b6, and now you simply pick up the b6 pawn while e5 is never a move because you're still in the square, you're still able to stop the pass pawn. So, this bishop to d2 move was nice because it, the opponent game is winning. And after bishop takes f, uh, sorry, bishop takes f6, bishop takes h6, eventually what happened in the game was that the outside passer was simply too strong to stop. Bishop to b2, bishop king to e4. Uh, white played all natural moves, trying to improve his position on each move. Bishop to f4, bishop a3, bishop to b8, a5. Uh, you could also play a6, but it doesn't really change much to the position. Um, the reason why black didn't play a6 was that after bishop to a7, bishop to c5, a5 would be very nice. So he puts his pawn on a5 instead. Uh, so that after bishop a7, you simply have bishop to c5. But now the dark squared pawn, uh, the pawns are in, will always be very weak. 
they have nowhere to go they cannot be pushed so they will also be on dark squares and at some point you're going to lose them probably bishop d8 bishop g1 and now uh white pushes g5 the reason for that is that after takes takes um followed by bishop e3 the pawn and game will be winning because you have to take because otherwise you lose b6 and a5 so bishop e3 is coming uh exchanging into winning pawn and game because you have an outside passer while black has the e pawn um so f5 check happened instead king to f4 bishop h2 check king f3 e5 and it seems kind of interesting but the Pass pawns that white has are simply stronger than the ones black has because they're farther up the board or sorry further up the board uh, g6 check king g7 king g2 bishop f4 and uh, now b6 drops and the game is over um so the game was yeah the bishop was simply too bad and the uh, bishop that white had was simply too strong because there were so many pawns on the dark squares uh, from black side while all the or most of the pawns that white had were on white squares. So that's that's the big theme in same color bishop end games that um, it's very useful for you if your opponent's pawns are on the same square as your own bishop. Um, so let's go to another game and uh, some other games selected as well um, So let's let's have a look at which one I'm going to show you at the uh, end of the stream I this one, but okay, let's go to another one first um, Yeah, let's go to this position so this was a game between Gary Kasparov in 1995 with white against uh, Nick Defirmian. He was a very strong grandmaster as well from uh, the US. And um, Gary was obviously pushing in this game. Again, what you see in this game is that there are so many pawns on the dog squares which is, uh, for black, which is a very bad sign. While most of white's pawns are on white squares. So again, it's very good to have the pawns on white squares because they simply cannot be attacked with this bishop. While this bishop can attack this one, it can attack this one, and eventually can maybe also attack the b6 pawn. So it's simply very good to uh, to have this kind of situation with all the pawns on dark squares. And probably the reason why um, the black player went for this endgame is because it's not so easy to break through. Uh, break through. Um, this king is blocking this uh these three squares so there's no way for this king right now to enter well this bishop on g5 can cover the h6 pawn can cover e5 and also perhaps go f6 and then everything will be covered so how how is white going to break through well first of all um kasparov played a very nice move here he played the move bishop to g7 and while this is a very nice move it's a very nice move because it basically forces black to play the move f6 to keep the pawns protected and it kind of means that or it does mean that you have forced another pawn to a dark square so uh it's definitely a very nice achievement for white to force the pawn to a dark square because otherwise black would probably leave this pawn left seven uh meaning that this bishop can never attack it but if it's get if it gets forced to f6 black has no options and um it simply will get weak at some point um and white played a very nice winning move um if you're watching the stream uh try to find the nice or the best winning plan here try to find a way to break through um and uh, suggest it in chat fisher tag knight for pawn against use So, um, the thing about this position is that this bishop doesn't have a lot of squares. It has to keep on protecting the pawns because if either of the pawns get lost, it's very easy. It's a very simple uh, position for white. So, the bishop has to keep on protecting both pawns. So, it, does, it doesn't have any squares, basically. While this king has to keep on, has to be in a c6 square to, get, uh, to keep the king out of the b5 square. So, 
Uh, Kasparov played a very simple move, bishop to h8, uh, as suggested by Karen Jait in chat. Um, because it forces a king move. There's no bishop move to keep on protecting the f6 pawn. So it forces king to d6. Now king to b5, entering. But white is not there yet, king to c7. Uh, white has made a little bit of progress, but he's not winning yet. So um, now white needs to find another plan to make more progress. Uh, bishop to g7. King to b7 forced, there's no bishop moves. Bishop to f8. Um, now you could consider maybe a bishop move, but it makes more sense to keep on waiting with the king. Uh, one reason for that is because you don't want to allow this bishop to be attacking b6, so you don't want to allow bishop e7, king d bishop to d8. Um, so the king needs to be on c7 at some point anyway. So bishop to e7. And now there's one move to try and save the position, um, which is bishop uh, king to d7. Uh, because now um, it's simply not... Sorry. Um, bishop d8 is simply... Is just not possible. While on the other hand, uh, king takes b6 is also not possible. So Kasparov has to move the bishop back. Um, now, king to c7 could be played, but uh, black started with bishop to e3. Doesn't make a big difference. But in this position, uh, Kasparov went for the went for the win. It was a plan that couldn't have been stopped anyway. But uh, if you're watching the stream again, uh, try to suggest the winning plan for white here. Uh, it's not so easy to break through. You could, for example, suggest king to a6, but after king to c7, the king is not really going anywhere. The king cannot enter on either b8 or b7 because those squares are covered. So you cannot enter like that. Um, we've already seen that the bishop on e3 is able to defend the king side if necessary, if the bishop tries to attack it. So that's not the winning plan either. So try to suggest the winning plan here for black uh, for white. Instead of king e7, what about bishop e3? How does white make progress? Yeah. So um, in this position, is if you go bishop to e3, the problem is that you take the pawn. So black was black was forced to play king to d7 because there is no good bishop move without losing f6. And if king to b7, then you simply play bishop to d8. Uh, so black had an only move there. Uh, but we have this position. And uh, try to find the winning plan for, for white. Um, yeah, so it's a, it's a very difficult winning plan. And the winning plan has to do with this h6 pawn. Um, and also with the fact that white is already up a pawn. So it's a nice position for white because he has actually he's up a, he's up a pawn on the king side as well. Uh, without the pawn being on, let's say we have the same position but without the pawn on g3, it would actually not be so easy. But the whole winning plan, it's not bishop to d2, it's an interesting suggestion. But the end game could actually even be lost for white. You do take the b6 pawn, but um, yeah, you're simply not even going to promote the a. Well, you might promote the a pawn, but um, such pawn end games, for example, could easily be losing. You're never really uh, pushing these end games for a win. So bishop d2 is not the move. Um, bishop to f8 would simply be answered with I think king to c7, um, and you haven't made progress yet because of bishop g7, bishop g5. Again, everything is protected. So the move actually in this position for white is pawn to g5. It's a very surprising move and it's one of the reasons why it's so good for white to be up a pawn. Uh, because he can now give way back one without being down a pawn. So if the pawn on g3 was away, then black would simply take and he would have an extra pass pawn. But after f takes g5, which is forced, if... Uh, bishop takes g5, we go king takes b6, we have the extra a pawn which will promote. And if h takes g5, we'll go, for example, yeah, just simply h6 and the h pawn will promote. So you have to go f takes g5, but now we go g4. And now we've simply changed the structure 
so that the bishop is not able to protect h6 anymore. We are threatening to go bishop to f8 at, and win the pawn. So um, you can go king to e8, but the problem is now bishop d6. Not only going bishop c7, bishop takes b6, but also the e5 pawn is about to drop. So uh, in the game, black went king to e6. But now Kasparov entered on c6 with the king. Um, black waited another move, and now bishop to d6 happened. And finally, the bishop is entering and taking the pawn. So it was a very, very nice winning plan, I think, by Kasparov in this game. Uh, sacrificing back the pawn to uh, kind of worsen the structure for black so that the bishop wasn't able to protect the h6 pawn. And I think it's uh, actually a rather instructive idea. Um, that's not that easy to find. Um, and it's actually very obvious again that putting the pawns on the same squares as your bishop is a very, very bad idea in these endgames. Um, Tomorrow, actually, your lecturer will maybe say something different than what I'm saying today. Because tomorrow, the lecture is going to be about opposite colored bishops. And in opposite colored bishops, you actually want to very often have the pawns on the squares of your own bishop. Um, because here, what I'm saying today is that you want your pawns opposite of your bishop. But if they are opposite of your bishop, you're never able to protect them. So you have to be a bit careful um, with opposite color bishops because let's say this bishop would be on d3 and uh, Black would have a dark square, uh, sorry a light square bishop while white has a dark square bishop. He's able to take all of our pawns um, And attack them While we are able to do nothing um, It kind of works both ways. We would also maybe be able to take his pawns, but in opposite color and games uh, It's definitely uh, very different than um than what I'm saying today. So in same colored uh, bishop endgames, I would say put the pawns on the opposite color of your own bishop and try to force your opponent's pawns on the color of his bishop. Um, what if g4 after bishop f8 protecting pawn on h6? Yeah, so um, the idea of g5 was that after f takes g5, we do not go bishop f8. It's actually very good that you uh, say this. Now g4 would indeed be a very strong move. Because now again h6 is protected. I said however that the idea was not to go bishop f8. What happened in the game was to move g4. So let me get rid of the arrows to make it a bit more uh, or easy to see. So what happened here was uh, g5 sacrificing the pawn, forcing f takes g5, and then follow it up by playing g4, uh, stopping black from playing g4. And now bishop f8 is inevitable, and um, black will eventually lose, uh, start losing pawns and uh, start losing this game. So uh, I think I'm going to end the stream for today. Uh, I showed three uh, nice games, or I hope they, they were nice games. And kind of show the ideas in same color end games. Again, I'm going to uh, say it again. Uh, put you, the pawns on the opposite color of your own bishop, while keeping your opponent's pawns on the color of his bishop. So, as in this position, you can see this bishop. The only task this bishop has is protecting its own pawns, while it can never ever attack any of our pawns. Well, our, our bishop is very free. Our bishop is never is never forced to protect any of our pawns because they simply cannot be attacked. While our bishop is free to attack any of our opponent's pawns, and as you can see in this uh, position, it simply can at some point be very very difficult to keep on protecting them for our opponent. And uh, so yeah, that's that's I think the good way to summarize today's stream. I hope you enjoyed it. Hope you learned something from today's stream and uh, yeah, probably